I'm going to talk to you today about stewarding your heart. We're starting a series this morning about stewardship. And I'm going to teach this morning on how to steward your heart, from what the Bible says about stewarding the heart. And I'm also going to, we're going to teach next week on steward, stewarding your finances, and then after that on stewarding your relationships. And I'm trusting with the grace of God that uh, you're going to be blessed this morning. I really do. It's going to get really practical. I'm going to get into the Scriptures. And I think one of the most profound areas that we need to address as disciples of Jesus Christ is this thing called the heart. That the Bible speaks of the heart. It speaks of um, uh, the heart being a wellspring. And so, uh, Paul, come and pray for the message while I actually just deal with my technology, please. Wonderful. <clears throat> let's do this. Uh, let's, let's prepare our hearts. Now, stewardship is a, is a big, big topic that requires us to, to, to partner with God. And uh, Romans tells us that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. And undoubtedly, some of what we will experience through this very serious will potentially challenge your own heart. And let's be honest, you've got one or two choices. You're going to apply, surrender, allow God to, to journey with Him, or we're going to put up walls, right? Maybe we're not prepared to allow God to come there. Maybe we might even be offended by what might challenge us, right? If I, maybe I'm the only honest one. So let me, let me pray, let me pray. Is that right? Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And I thank you that your word is there to challenge and to help us grow and to become more like Jesus. And so, Lord, this morning as we sit here, we posture our hearts and we're positioned to receive from you. We thank you that, Lord, where your spirit is, there is freedom and there is life. And so this morning we ask for fresh revelation to come. We ask for open hearts to receive and to at the same time, God, have the courage to apply Lord, what is being shared and what will be shared so that we can take what has been said and apply it to our lives so we can grow and mature in our faith. We thank you for what is going to be shared. We pray that we would take it, that we would heap a harvest of 60, 100 fold in this time. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come. We honor you, Lord. Pray for grace upon Michael, even as he shares, and the word this week. Michael's ready to go. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. Just getting my emotions in check. I just needed to get beyond that. Forgive me. That's why I launched in straight away. Otherwise, I'll be a mess up here. You know, it's tough to see how people suffer. It really is. And there's sufferings that are going on. And uh, Jesus Christ speaks of the fellowship in his sufferings. I've been crucified with Christ. If only we could grasp a hold of that truth. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Amen? And uh, one of, one of, one of the, the privileges that we have in walking with Jesus is not just fellowshipping in the victory of the cross, but also in sufferings. We live in a suffering, broken world. Amen? And uh, we don't live, even though we challenges come our way, we do not live as people who are without hope. Yeah. These are difficult days, and they will get more difficult. But God in His infinite wisdom has determined the times and the seasons and the places where you will live. So that by, by, by virtue of the fact that He is preordained that you would be alive in this season at this time, He sees something in you and on you that is special for the hour that we find ourselves in. Amen? Amen? And so, I want to start off with this passage of Scripture. I'm going to give it to you by way of an introduction to this series called Stewardship. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And every single one of you have been given a trust by God. Even your body, the very essence of who you are, your being is a trust that is given to you from God. Everything that we have actually comes from God. Amen? And so a steward is one who faithfully looks after and manages something that belongs to someone else. 
A steward is one who faithfully looks after and manages something that belongs to someone else. And you are all stewards. The book of Romans, Paul the Apostle said this. These notes will be up on the... Uh, uh, we're actually going to give you these notes in PDF form this week. But the book of Romans, Paul the Apostle, in Romans chapter 11, said this. He said, from him and through him and unto him are all things. Another version says that everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. And if you want to learn to be a good steward, and boy, oh boy, does the world need disciples of Jesus who understand what stewardship is all about. But if you are going to be a good, faithful steward, as it says, you've been given a trust, you've got to prove faithful. It actually begins with the revelation of where everything comes from. And so Romans chapter 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Colossians tells us that all things were created by him and for him. All things, whether in the heavens or on the earth, were created by God and for God. And the psalmist said, the, Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it belong to God. They are His. And of course, then we know that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And things haven't changed. He put Adam and Eve in the garden to work the garden and to take care of it, to steward it, to be good stewards of what He had created. Because all of it was created by Him and for Him. And when we learn to steward our lives and the things that God entrusts to us, we've got to prove our faithfulness and, and, and our stewardship of everything is for His glory and His honor and His praise. Amen. Amen. And so it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Paul said in Romans that each of us is going to give an account to God. And that day is coming. And that day is coming soon. I honestly believe the day is coming soon where every single disciple of Jesus will have to give him an account for everything that he has actually given us. Every aspect of life, we will give him an account. And that's why we need to be faithful as stewards. And Paul said to the church in Corinth, as I said, all of these will be online. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We do it for, for the glory of God, for His honor and for His praise. Amen? Amen? And so we see from those verses I quoted, I didn't give the references, but I was quoting Scripture, that when stewards, stewardship begins with a revelation that the origin of all things is from God. Everything comes from Him. Secondly, that He owns all things. He owns you. You were bought with the price, and that price is the blood of Jesus Christ. He created you for His good pleasure. The Scriptures say, do you not know that you are not your own? You were bought with a price. So origin, all things come from God. Ownership, everything is owned by God the Father Himself. And therefore, what He does is He puts, as He did in the Garden of Eden, He puts trustees in place to steward what belongs to him. And we have to prove faithful. Jesus Christ in the gospel of Luke chapter 16, when he was actually talking about money, the context here was money, but it's far more. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 from verse 10, he said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. It's an incredible thing, isn't it? The greatest area where we fall in the area of stewardship is actually even with our money, with our finances. We fall the most. It's the biggest area of challenge that we face today is the stewardship of the resources that He gives us. 
And it's an interesting thing. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little, if you are trustworthy with the little he gives you, he will give you more. And if you're not getting more, you've got to ask yourself, are you trustworthy with the little he's given you? So many want more, but they're not faithful with the little. Yeah. Now, I'm not too sure about you. When our children were growing up, we wouldn't give them more of what they messed up. Yeah. Would you, as a parent? If you had a child growing up that just squandered, would you give them more to squander? Or would you hold back until they learned the lesson? of faithfulness and stewardship. Why do we treat God differently? Amen. Amen. And then lastly, just out of that, as a way of an introduction, is that everything we do in stewarding life, stewarding ourselves, in stewarding our time, our resources, whatever it actually is, we do it for the glory of God, to acknowledge Him, to thank Him, to praise Him, to honor Him. And through our actions, to do all of this. Isn't that amazing? So let's look at stewardship of the heart. The Bible actually speaks of the heart. In fact, the Greek word is cardia, interestingly enough. And if we look at Scripture, we see from the book of Thessalonians and from the book of Hebrews that you are made up of essentially three parts, spirit, soul, and body. The Scriptures tell us in 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it says, may, the God, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see clearly there in this one passage alone, it speaks of your whole spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, many would say that from a scriptural point of view, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And you have a spirit. And, of course, you are housed in a body, your earth suit. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, speaking of God's word, it says, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Joints and marrow, which is the body. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Now, in describing what the word of God does, it talks about soul and spirit and body. And there's another reference there. The scriptures also tell us that the spirit of man is the lamp or the candle of the Lord. When God communicates with us and he fellowships with us, it's in our spirit. It is spirit to spirit. Deep calls to deep. Your spirit is the lamp or the candle of the Lord. Amen? And so when, when the scriptures talk about the heart of man or the heart of woman, what it's talking about simplistically, it's the, your inner man or your inner woman. It's you. It's the sum total of your soul and your spirit. It's called the heart, the heart of man. And the Bible tells us, and I want you, I've just listened to this. I'm going to just go through this very quickly, but you can either have a good heart or a bad heart. And so a good heart is a heart that's prepared to seek God. It is fixed on God. It is joyful in God. It is perfect with God. It is upright. It is clean. It is pure. It is tender. It is single and sincere. It is honest and good. It is broken and contrite. It is obedient. It is filled with God's law. It is awed by the word of God, filled with the fear of God. It is meditative. It is void of fear. It is desirous of God. It is enlarged. It is faithful to God. It's confident in God. It is sympathizing. It is prayerful. It is inclined to obedience. It is wholly devoted to God. I'm quoting each one of these as a separate scripture about the heart. It is zealous. It is wise. And it is a treasury of good. But a bad heart is hateful towards God. It is full of evil. It is full of evil imaginations, full of vain thoughts. It is set to do evil. It is desperately wicked. It is far from God. It is not perfect with God. It's not prepared to seek God. It's a treasury of evil. It is darkened. It is prone to error. It is prone to depart from God. It is impenitent, unbelieving, blind, uncircumcised, of little worth. 
It is deceitful, it is divided, double, hard, haughty, influenced by the devil, carnal, covetousness, self-centered, despiteful, ensnaring, it is foolish, and it goes on and on and on and on. It's interesting that the list, the bad list, is far longer. You see, it is from your heart that all the issues of life flow. Your heart determines the course of your life. And if we look around the world today, we look at cancel culture, we look at the poison we see, we look at the poison that far too many in the church themselves have partaken of and become, it is symptomatic of heart trouble. There's a lot of heart trouble today, both in the church and outside the church. How do we know that? Look at the way people speak of one another, how they deal with one another, how fast do we criticize one another. Jim and I had the privilege on Friday of being in a, in a seminar of 25 other leaders from all around Auckland. And uh, there were two, two men who actually led the session from the United States of America, one called Dr. Sam Chand. He had just spent a few days with Life Church, all their leaders, with with equippers, with uh, New Life, with the AOG, and then the independent churches. There were 25 different leaders actually got together. And he actually spoke about PTSD, that there is not one pastor he's come across anywhere in the world that's not suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. You've got a world that's actually come that is suffering with PTSD as a result of COVID. But what he's saying was that pastors double PTSD because you were dealing with the PTSD of everyone and including your own. And they were talking about a whole range of things that are actually going on and how uh, one comment he made, which really uh, stuck out for me, and it was this. He said, the list of those who will celebrate when he falls has grown very long. But yet those who will cheer him on when he succeeds has grown very short. And so therefore in life, it's good to watch and see who cheers when you are successful. Because a lot of people have got something to say when you fail. And the list is huge. Something's gone wrong in life today. He actually also shared, I mean, that's a question I'm going to talk to my team about this week about PTSD. We're going to get honest with each other. He said that uh, in his experience, this PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is 100% amongst church leaders. (laughs) That was his opinion. He speaks to thousands of leaders in many countries around the world. He's in his 70s, an incredible man. It was a privilege to meet him. What he also shared, and this was just a side issue, that over the next six to eight years in the United States of America alone, between four and 500,000 church leaders in various parts of church leadership are stepping out of ministry or handing over churches or stepping out of ministry. That coupled with the fact that attendance at Bible colleges in America have radically plummeted. We're going to have a supply and demand crisis because the church is growing by 200,000 people a day. We need to pray. Amen. Amen. The reason why I'm saying this is because the struggles are very real. The struggles are very real. And I honestly believe it's an issue of stewardship of the heart in the midst of all of it. Amen? Amen. And so I want to just quickly tell you about two trees, and then we're going to get practical on how to, how to steward the wellspring of life. But I thought about this long and deep. And I was just actually saying to some of the leaders that it took me almost a week to put one paragraph together of good theology for you. And then I wasn't sure whether I was going to give it to you. But I want to tell every one of you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me tell you about two trees and two diets. Because I was actually very, very, I'm very I must be honest, eh? this man here I love with all my heart. And I'm so proud of him. This is his slimmer brother. <laughs> Frankie's lost 36 kilograms. 36. And we all are going to make sure he keeps it off. 
Amen? There's no such thing as culture and eating. It's just my culture. Now, is it kingdom culture? All right. Small portions, little plates. You want a small portion? Just start serving small plates. And then have a height limitation. It's quite simple. Simple exercise. But I'm proud of him. But it didn't happen by default. He put a program in place of discipline. It was quite simple. You'll never outrun your fork. Sort out your diet. Eat good food. You want to eat good food? Put good food in your fridge. Very simple. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. Eat good food? Put good food in your fridge. Get rid of all the bad food. Get your whole family on board. Go and walk together, and while you're walking, pray. Don't just allow the prayer meeting on a, on, on a Tuesday to be the only time that you might walk. Well, it's winter now, so most don't walk. You should be walking even if it's snowing. Amen? So what has Frankie done? He's been very, very intentional to steward his outer man. If you're not intentional to steward your inner man, you're going to become anorexic. And what's to come on this planet and the challenges that lie ahead? You're not going to have the muscles to overcome and persevere. And Jesus wants you to persevere and he wants you to overcome. With Adam and Eve, he created a garden. In the garden, in the midst of the garden, he put two trees. The one was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the one was the tree of life. And Adam, the intention from the Father. People think that when Adam was created, he was created perfect. He was created biologically perfect. He was created perfect in every sense, but he was still a baby in a, in a maturity sense. Adam still had to progress and grow and, mat and mature in Christ-likeness. And so the, father in, in, the Father's intention was that Adam would not only share his image and his likeness, and that's where we stop, but that also that Adam would share his life, his spirit, his mind, and his nature. And the tree of God's life in the Garden of Eden, because it wasn't just a tree of life, it was the tree of God's life in the Garden of Eden, was the only means by which Adam could attain this state of being and living. He had to mature and grow. But the tree was the highest life and it was available to Adam only. And in eating and partaking only of the, fr the fruit of the tree of God's life, Adam would then live in vital union and fellowship with the Father, which would result in his ongoing moral, mental, and spiritual development. Because if you understand the big picture, you are not just saved so you could be a son or a daughter of God. But God's intention is also that you would be an heir. Now, I'm not too sure about you. If I had $10 million in my estate, in my will, I would be a fool to leave $10 million to kids. And so when I did practice law and did wills, I still do some of them now. If the person has a substantial estate, we always go, at what age do you want them to inherit? We had a conversation recently, didn't we? Eric, you and I. Is it 20, 25, 30? And so if you're wise and you have a big estate, it's going to be some at 18, some at 20, some at 25, maybe some at 30, maybe even some at 35. Because if you get your lotto ticket when you're 18 and you've just won $30 million, you're going to be bankrupt in two years' time because you can't handle. That's a, probably a terrible analogy. But a parent would be a fool, unwise, to leave the entire state to a child who's not ready for it. Would you agree? But yet the Scriptures tell us that we are co-heirs with Christ from the day we got born again. Now I want to ask you a question. We're not talking a few million here. All things were created by him and for him. And then we are called co-heirs with him. But the scriptures do say, but as long as you remain a child, you're going to have to have trustees to look after what belongs to you. That's, I'm quoting scripture. This will be in the notes online. You, so some of you wonder, 
Why are you not experiencing the breakthroughs in some areas of your life? Have you matured and grown from here to here so God can entrust you more? Because here's the deal. Adam, as a child of God, had to partake of the tree of life, the God's life. And he was given a responsibility to steward what God had given him to rule and reign, to have dominion, to advance the rule and reign of God, the garden and across the entire planet, starts with a little garden and becomes the world and far more. Because there's an age to come when Christ returns to this earth where he's handing out assignments to those who have proved faithful in their stewardship of what he's entrusted to them. Now, we all talk about end times and the end of this age is going to come. And the sands of time are running out very, very quickly. But we don't live that way. I'm not too sure about you. But if this little speck, this little inch over here, is a tiny little square on the, on the, on the pattern set, but that represents my life, this life, on this side of the return of Christ. And what I do in that determines an infinite line of existence and possibility and responsibility and, and, and assignments that are going to be handed out by Christ. Surely we should be faithful back there and live not for the square, but live for what's to come. That's why 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, they knew absent from the body present with the Lord. They knew that they would be persecuted and suffer for His name's sake. They knew that Acts chapter 1-8 that says, you will be my witnesses. They didn't have English. They spoke in Latin. They spoke in Greek. And the word for witness in Acts 1-8 is martus, from where we get the word martyrs. Even to the point of death, they would not compromise. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And so here's the deal. You're not just a son of God, but you're an heir. And he is working with you and training you and equipping you as you eat of the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ himself. As you eat of the bread of life, of the tree of life, God's own life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you eat and partake of the life of Jesus Christ, intentionally, not by, def not by default, but by design, you are being prepared for thrones. So it is from sonship, sonship, to heirship, to throneship. And he says, in his parables, if you're faithful with what he's given you, he'll give you 10 cities. And 20 cities, what is he talking about? The earth is groaning in eager expectation, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. The earth is groaning, the book of Romans says, in eager expectation, waiting for the sons of God, that's you and I, male and female, to be revealed to the world. He is preparing you for thrones. He's preparing you for an age to come where the manifold wisdom of God himself will be made known to the principalities, the powers, and the forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. But you have to learn to steward your heart. And how you steward your heart is by eating from the tree of life. Are you with me? It's interesting when you look at Scripture. I don't know about you. I'm a dad and I'm a granddad. It would be heartbreaking and traumatic when a child is born and you're going coochie coo in the cot and it's beautiful and this happens. And there's, but you come back six months later, the child hasn't grown. You come back a year later, the child is still in the cot and hasn't grown. It's traumatic. For a parent, for a grandparent, you'd look at this and go, wow, why do we do that to our walk with God? The scriptures tell us this, until Christ is formed in you. 
God has predestined that you will be conformed to the image of His Son. That you will bear the image of the heavenly man, that's Jesus. That you'll be transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory. That you're being inwardly, inwardly renewed day by day. That you will grow to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. That you'll become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And that you'd be like Jesus. And that you'd no longer be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the cunningness of men in their deceitful scheming. And there are far too many in the church today that are being caught up in the wrong causes. Fighting the wrong battles, wrong causes. How do I know? I just go online and watch. The wrong causes. You just got to stop people in their tracks, your brothers and sisters in their tracks, and ask them, would Christ say what you've just said? In everything, would Christ say what you are saying? Would Christ do what you are doing? And then ask, am I eating from the wrong tree? Am I eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will put you on a pathway of fighting the wrong cause. Our cause is Christ and His kingdom and nothing else. It's what we seek first, it's what we seek last, it's what we give up life for. It is the pearl of great price and it is the treasure hidden in the field. What tree are you eating from? Good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil? Or are you eating from the tree of life? Because God has planned that you'll be conformed to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. That's incredible. Amen? And he knows how to turn up the heat. Because let's be honest, change comes around in one of two ways. By seeing the light, which you're receiving this morning, or feeling the heat. Through situation or revelation. I'm not too sure about you. I would rather have it through seeing the light and through revelation than feeling the heat. Most of us, we change, especially me, by feeling the heat. Amen? And so, our key passage for this morning is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says this, Above all else, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. My brothers and sisters, above all else, Above all else, guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. It is the wellspring of life. Everything pertaining to life comes out of your wellspring, which is your heart. Guard it. Do you know how to guard your heart? So we're going to look quickly at how to guard the heart and how to grow the heart. Many hearts have become like open sewers. You can dump anything into them. I can guarantee you, if Frankie comes off his diet and gets onto some previous dietary habits, like all of us, and I'm picking on him because I'm proud of him, he's just going to put it back on again. Am I right? And so the reality is this, above, all heart, all, above everything else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. And make sure that you are eating on the right things. That's my big problem. What are you eating mentally? What are you feeding into your eye gate? What are you listening to? What are you watching? Because it looks like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is growing rampant. And people, brothers and sisters of mine in Christ, have, have taken on the wrong causes, are walking down the wrong pathways. People I've walked with for years in this church and outside this church are losing their way because they're eating from the wrong tree. They become politicians, they're, on, they're on, on the wrong cause. And I don't know whose quote this is, but let me be honest with you. I need to get a little bit angst on this because it's hard to see people suffer. But the World Wide Web may not have enabled the lame to walk, but it has certainly enabled the dumb to speak. 
The World Wide Web has given people platforms that don't come from God. You don't have a grace for the platform. You now got historians quoting history, but they've never been to school. We've all become experts in, in our own lunch times. And if I sound angst over this, because I am, because we're eating the wrong stuff and we're on the wrong diet, let's get back onto the right diet. So we've got to learn to guard our hearts. And how do we do that? Three quick points. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13, it's the key text under guarding your heart after the wellspring. So Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, with all vigilance and all diligence and all discipline, guard it because this, it's, uh, it, it is the wellspring of all issues of life. Then 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13, the New International Version says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when, when, uh, when Jesus Christ is revealed. The King James says, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Now, it doesn't make sense when you don't know about girding your loins and all that stuff, the old English, but let me explain that rather. The King James in 1 Peter 1.13 says, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. To gird means to bind or encircle around your waist with a belt. So in those days, if a man was wearing like a, a dupenu or a, a, what's it, is it Iefei Kanga? The, the skirt, I wore them in Tonga there on the strip. Uh, you needed to run. It's hard to run. So you just lift it up and you tuck it in. You tuck it into, your, into the waistband. And so you're girding your loins with a belt, if you understand what I'm saying. And so to gird means to bind or to encircle. It's to equip for action. And so it says here, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Your loins are the place of generative power. I don't need to explain it. But read generative powers from the loins. You get what I'm saying. You can explain it to your kids when they get home. But gird up the loins. It's the place of regenerative power. They, Paul's using an analogy for the mind. Above all. Guard your mind above all else because it's the wellspring. Mind and your heart is the wellspring of life. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The biggest battle you face is the battle in your thinking. Therefore, it is the area in your life you have to guard it and steward it well and feed it well with the right stuff. So he says here, gird up the loins. Gird up your mind. Very, very important. And how, we, how do we do that? Well, Romans 12, 1 says, don't conform. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 speaks about renewing your mind. So how do I, I guard my mind? Number one is, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know why it's such a big deal? Because they said, Jesus, your mum is outside, your brother's outside, and your sisters are outside. And so Jesus said, let me ask you a question. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? How's that for a dividing line in the sand? Those who do the will of my Father in heaven are my mother and my brother and my sisters. Here Paul in, in, uh, in the book of Romans says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this, this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation of your life comes through primarily through your thinking, your soul. And there's a war for your soul. Your spirit belongs to God, but there's a war for your soul. The domination of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Satan knows as he can change the way you think, he will change you. Because your thinking is like the bit in the mouth of a a horse. Whoever controls the bit controls the direction of the horse. Whoever controls the rudder on the ship, can control a little piece of metal at the back of a ship will determine the course of that ship. And he says, don't be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world wants to contort you and twist you into its way of thinking. And I'm not sure about you, but I, 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 the elders will tell you, that one of the prayers I actually pray the most, 
is, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. This, this wind is blowing. We've got this identity issue blowing. We've got racism and culture and the hurts of the past. And Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. And here's the wisdom. God's word. Jesus said, Jesus said, just keep the default. Put it all on Jesus. Jesus said, God said, despite the backlash of how intolerant you will come across, just keep quoting God and take the flack for it. Don't try and wrestle this or wrestle that or get too smart in this or too smart in that. Just quote Jesus. Just quote the Word of God. Don't become, don't let anti-abortion become your cause. It's the wrong cause. Just talk pro-life. Just talk about the sanctity of life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just get back to God's word. Make sure your cause is God's cause, but your, word, but your words need to be his words. Did you wonder that why Jesus said, I only do what my father does and I only say what he says? Jesus was in the midst of the Roman Empire. You take on Caesar, you're in trouble. You put yourself forward as a God in place of God, Caesar. You die. And what did he do? Right up until the cross, I only do what my Father says, and that's what we've got to do the same. Therein lies the wisdom on how to deal with this world. Amen? So the second thing is saturate your mind. This is under guarding your mind. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And I want to encourage you with this. Philippians, so the first point was renew your mind. Learn to renew it. And you renew it with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. We'll get into that in a moment. The second point under guarding your mind, guarding your heart, is to saturate your mind. Philippians 4.8 says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. And And talk about such things. And if they are not excellent, if they're not lovely, if it's not pure, if it's not admirable, and if it's not right, don't talk about it. I struggle a little bit sometimes with defaulting into seeing the the negative in the situation. Especially if people hurt me, I want to grumble. Matthew 18 says, don't tell anyone. Go and sort it out with them. But I'm just at least going to tell my wife because we want flesh. Do you know what I'm saying? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And if you ain't got something nice to say, you know, we've all got blind spots. Some of you need to turn around to the people that are in your little bubble. And you need to actually have the courage to take somebody aside and say, you know what? The confession of your heart is negative all the time. And I notice you talk about my sister negatively all the time. Or you pull down my brother on a regular basis. We shouldn't be doing that. And I'm actually part, I'm guilty of that sin with you because I've said nothing. But you're actually a gossip. And it needs to stop. Because you're starting fires and you're always moaning. You see, the mouth is an overflow of what's in the heart. And if this is like a sewer, it's because you've actually allowed rubbish to be dumped into the wellspring of your heart. You've become captive to vain philosophies and the wrong causes and looking at the wrong stuff. We've got to stop. Eat from the tree of life, from Christ himself. Now, we're all challenged with this, aren't we? It's not easy. The third point is discipline your mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, this is under the heading of God. The first point is renew your mind. Second point is saturate your mind. And the third point is discipline your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, you know what a stronghold is? 
Paul had in mind when he wrote this castles. You see my favorite movie, Braveheart. They've got to go up the ramparts of the castle, and it's like carnage, and it's, it's hard to penetrate those ancient ca- castles. Paul's talking about patterns of thinking in the head that become strongholds. We've allowed strongholds to develop. It's exactly what Satan wants to happen. When you have a pattern of thinking that's become a stronghold that is not godly, you've surrendered yourself to the enemy. And he will use you like a horse with a bit in its mouth. He says we demolish arguments. Isn't that interesting? Why are we arguing so much today over things we shouldn't be arguing about? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's ongoingly. That's the biggest battle. It's not the outer battle. It's the battle between our ears for the way we think. It's huge. It's massive. It's massive. It's massive. Let me take five minutes, ten minutes to talk about growing the heart. That's all guarding the heart. And there's more but we'll put them online for you so you can go and actually be diligent and be disciplined and go and read the Scriptures and search the Scriptures to see if what I'm saying is true. Amen? Do you know that Jesus grew? Incredible. The tree of life itself grew. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 26, it says of the boy Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, 26, the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Now, when you go and read the life of the boy Samuel, you know what you actually found about the boy Samuel? While his mates were running around and mucking around, he would sneak into the temple. While they were just eating of the tree of knowledge and good and evil and doing their thing, Samuel would be found in the temple. He wanted to be in the presence of God. And he grew in wisdom and stature and favor. The same passage that spoke of Jesus spoke of Samuel. He grew. And God has preordained that you're going to grow. And we're going to grow collectively into the full measure of the stature of Christ. Amen? Isn't that cool? So cool. Wonderful. So we look at the life of Christ. I'm going to summarize this, and it'll be in the notes. But if we look at the life of Jesus Christ, the Gospel of John, 1 John tells us that he or she who claims to abide in Christ must walk as Christ walked. Whoever claims to be in Jesus or to abide in him must walk as Jesus walked. Jesus knew how to grow his heart. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with men. What did he do to grow? You see, the kingdom of God is forcefully advanced and forceful men and women lay hold of it. A a default culture is never a good one. Look at your garden. Hey, Glenn. All those weeds, Glenn. 11 hectares, brother. Glenn will tell you, If he doesn't pay attention to his 11 hectare garden, 11 acres, he's going to be in trouble in a year. Am I right? The weeds grow. Default culture in the kingdom is never a good one. The children of God have to be intentional. And we look at the life of Christ, he was very intentional. And it's quite simple. How did he grow his heart? Well, I've called them holy habits. Some people call them spiritual disciplines. But disciplines scare off Gen Z. Run them, chase them away. Let's call them holy habits. It's quite simple. Jesus intentionally arranged his life, even as a young boy, so that he would grow in wisdom, in stature, and in favor. 
And you're going to find this rather simple. But what is the... There's two kinds of habits. There's called inward habits and external habits. Inner habits that you need to cultivate and be intentional about. And there are outer habits. The inward habits are prayer, meditation. These are all in the notes. Fasting and study. Those are the things you do to grow your your inner woman, your inner man, to grow your heart. Those are inner disciplines or inner habits that are important. And so as in the natural, you go on a diet and you arrange your life around intentional steps. To grow in the spirit and to grow your heart. We've already gone through protecting your heart. But to grow your heart, you have to be intentional. And the first one is prayer. The second one's meditation. The third one's fasting. And the fourth one is study. Those are called inward habits. But then there are outward habits. Listen to them. Simplicity. I'll come back to them. Solitude and silence. Submission and service. So what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus actually prayed. Hello? <laughs> he prayed. It's not just about coming to a prayer meeting. Well, that's important. He prayed. He always prayed with his father. He prayed to his father. He had fellowship and communion. He had conversations with his, with, with his father. Each one of these is a, a sermon on its own. But your life has to be punctuated or saturated with prayer. You have to, to eat of the tree of life is to actually pray. And it's mostly listening rather than speaking. Because I'm not too sure about you. If you sat down and I could say you could have lunch with anyone, you might, including Jesus, I'm sure you're going to have lunch with Jesus. Can you imagine? You go into the restaurant, you sit down, and two hours later the Lord says, can I get a word in? Surely you'd want, to be, you'd want to just listen. Prayer is two ears to listen and one mouth to speak. That's conversation with God. The next thing that Jesus did was he meditated. He grew in wisdom. And we've got to learn the holy habit of meditation. And meditation is not study. Meditation is the art. It's a cultivating a habit of meditating upon the Word of God with the Spirit of God. It's not studying where you're looking for Greek and Hebrew and the Strongs and the Vines and all that sort of stuff. I mean, a lot of people today think that Strongs is the local gym and Vines is the local pub. There's a whole generation who got no idea what I'm saying. And some people get so stuck in the Greek and the Hebrew, they just can't get beyond Greek and Hebrew. Meditate upon the Word. Read it. Meditate upon the Word. We're going to teach you how to do that. I think meditation is far more important than study. Because you're allowing with the Spirit of God as you read God's Word, you're prayerfully taking His Word and allowing His Word to take a hold of you. That's what meditation actually is. And we'll come back to that in the weeks to come. Fasting's a good one. Jesus fasted. He fasted. How do I know? Can anybody tell me one fast that He took that was quite a long one? 40 days. He fasted from food for 40 days. The modern day fast is to fast from your iGod. Sorry, I meant iPad and my phone. You know that first thing and the last thing you turn to? And then you look, look at all day. And then you post. And then you actually got to go back in and look at what people are saying about your post. And then you go back and read your post that you've posted that you know you posted because you typed it out. And then you go back and read it. I think it's a good fast. It would be a technology fast. Amen? Easier said than done. And some of you think you've mastered your technology. No, nah, come on. Be honest. I don't know anybody who's mastered their technology. Yeah, I do. Actually, those who don't have it. 
Study is another one. Go study God's Word. Rightly divide the Word of God. Learn how to study God's Word. We will teach you. Find out how to study His Word. Amen? The outward habits, very quickly, simplicity. Is your life simple or is it complex? A holy habit is the habit of simplicity. I had a tough week. Very tough week. I was at a seminar on my day off on a Friday. So if I don't respond on a Friday, please don't get offended. I know it's your day off, but... (laughs) But I went to a seminar on Friday with Jim. Saturday, I did some training with uh, Life Church in Manurewa with all their leaders all day Saturday morning, the whole morning, and then spent all evening preparing for this morning. Didn't make straight paths for myself. In my diary, I wasn't leading a life of simplicity, but I made it complex and I made it difficult after coming back from Tonga. It's crazy. How simple is your life? Or has it become complex? Are your children the new bosses in the home? Some of you, your Saturday is gone. I think some of you need to reevaluate whether your kids need to play all the sports that they're playing on a Saturday. I know you love Johnny. But if Johnny is not going to be a great tennis player, (laughs) and I know you love Susie, and you've got that violin, and she's doing those violin lessons, but if it sounds like she's strangling a cat on that violin, and the neighborhood cats are heading for the hills when she gets onto that violin, and it's like three years into violin lessons, I think it's time to make straight paths for yourself. (laughs) some of you your lives are completely overwhelmed by your children make straight paths for yourself I don't go and say listen I'm taking your drums away because Pastor Michael says you're a bad drummer that's where you're going to write don't put it on me just find the wisdom of God and lead a life of simplicity not duplicity simplicity is a holy habit cut away the stuff that can be cut away amen cut it away Solitude and silence. Oh, my gosh. So those who have got complex lives, the habit of simplicity is for you. For those who actually are suffer from FOMO with people, and I'm not going to say that that's Paul Firth because it would be bad to do that from the, from the pulpit. Eh? But those who talk a lot, other than the, the microphone, I've got to talk because I've got the microphone. But those who talk a lot and just suffer from FOMO, They're not at the restaurant or they're not on the whatever it may be. This is one for you, solitude and silence. Can I tell you this? A lot of the burnout and the PTSD is because of the noise. He's not in the earthquake. He's not in the fire. He's not in the tornado. It's the still, small voice of God. And the problem is you wonder why you're not hearing from God because you're not practicing this holy habit of of, of solitude and silence. You're not separating yourselves as the prophet Habakkuk set up onto the ramparts, which is the city walls to get away from the people and separating yourselves unto God. You're not allowing him to take you to green, still waters and green pastures so that he can talk to you. And for some people, silence is, 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 a, is a terrible thing because you need the noise. But solitude and silence needs to become a holy habit because unless you do that, you're not going to hear the voice of God. You're not going to learn how to meditate. Submission is the second last one, and that's a big deal. Are you truly in submission to God? Are you in submission to your wife? Are you in submission to your husband? Are you in submission to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you in submission to the leaders of this church? Truly. Are you truly in submission? According to the Scriptures. You can say you're in submission to God, but you're not in submission to your brothers in Christ. It's a swear word today in marriages, the issue of submission. Flies in the face of the cultures that are and the winds that are actually blowing. You've got to find what God means when he says that. Amen? And submission is a big deal. You want to know why? 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. And if you understand Scripture in Genesis chapter 6 on the fall, during the fall when those 200 watchers descended on the earth and corrupted the earth by cohabiting with women and producing the Nephilim, and what took place because of the flood, and then Genesis chapter, all that stuff, and then God punishing the nations in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and putting a SARS, a fallen prince, over each nation. Paul the Apostle says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Over every nation there's a fallen prince, principality. Over New Zealand there's a fallen prince. And then under that prince, fallen prince, Michael is, the, is a good prince. He's the prince of Israel. He's the archangel and the defender of Israel. But there are bad princes. God punished the nations. He put a prince over every nation. How do I know? The scriptures tell us. And I'm closing with this. The scriptures tell us that there's a principality of fallen sars over every nation. It goes back to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 and all that stuff you've heard me teach on. You think, what is he talking about there? It's too much. Paul says, we do not wrestle flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and forces of wickedness. And he says, put on the full armor of God. But what we forget is that you, unless you are in submission, you're a soldier with armor, but you've got no, there's no back plate. There's only a, a breastplate and a helmet and a sword. But it's your brothers and sisters in Christ. The back plate is your submission. It's when you close ranks and there's order in your marriage. And there's, you go look at chapter 5 of Ephesians chapter 6. Chapter 5 is submit to those in authority. Submission in your marriage. Your children are walking a life of obedience. It's, a, it's an army formation of submission. Under the headship of Christ himself, we submit to one another. Your submission is not optional if you're going to survive and thrive in, 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 uh, in the days that lie ahead. Not optional. It really isn't. We just need to get a hold of it. Amen? And that's the last one. Submission, the last one is service. We'll deal with these one by one. But that's it. Eat from the right tree. Eat from the right tree. Become disciplined as Frankie has been disciplined for a couple of months and we are all proud of him. Amen? As he's become intentional, you need to become intentional. Your calendar, your diary needs to reflect the holy habits of Jesus. How you deal with media needs to reflect the holy habits of Jesus. Ask yourself whether you are eating from the wrong tree or the right tree. And if your brother is fighting the wrong causes and got involved in the wrong conversations and getting involved in a whole bunch of stuff that he or she has walked off the pathway or walking off the pathway, no matter how just or honorable it may seem, You've got to come, learn to come alongside others and say, I'm learning to eat from the right tree. Are you eating from the right tree? Amen? Amen. Would you please stand? I'm going to pray over you. Bless you. I'm going to pray a prayer over you, a closing prayer. And this is to deal with the heart. And these are all scriptures. God knows your heart. He searches your heart. He enlightens your heart. He opens your heart. He recreates your heart. He tests your heart. He strengthens your heart and He establishes your heart. Isn't that cool? Why? Because He loves you. Amen. Let me pray for you. God knows your heart. That's, these are all scriptures. God knows your heart. He searches your heart. He enlightens your heart. He opens your heart. He recreates your heart. He tests your heart. The Spirit of God's here now. Let Him work on you right now. He strengthens your heart. And He establishes your heart. Father, I bring my brothers and sisters before you. Oh, we love you, Father.
we thank you for your presence. The wonderful presence of the Spirit here now. Father, I pray that you'll come by the power of your might, by the power of your Spirit. Search our hearts, Father. Enlighten them. That we may know the hope to which we've been called. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive more. Heal our hearts that are broken. Come, Father, by the power of your Spirit, Lord God, and help us to remove the distractions and where we picked up the wrong things and been eating the wrong stuff. Give us the courage, the courage, Lord God, the courage to change diets. Give us the courage, Lord God, and the strength. Strengthen us. Establish our hearts firmly in your presence. Oh, Lord God, lover of our souls, Jesus, oh, the lover of our souls, would you come and bring healing, bring down walls, bring down distractions. Behold the wood of the cross. It was thrown into Mara. Behold the wood of the cross and the power of the blood of Jesus. And so, Father, I bring my family before you. I speak over distraction. I speak over the bitterness of heart. I speak over the wellspring of life. I speak over the hearts that have become the waters of Mara, have become embittered. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for Calvary. I thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. And for those, Lord God, that are sick in their bodies because they have become polluted of heart, I pray for a healing and a supernatural breakthrough now in the name of Jesus. Blood disorders. Infirmities, sicknesses and diseases. We cancel your assignment through the power of the blood of Jesus. We break your hold in Jesus' precious name. And we speak healing and wholeness, healing and wholeness, healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus Christ, healing and wholeness in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask and pray, Lord, that you'd give us a revelation of this habit of submission, that we would submit one to another and become accountable in this endeavor, Lord God that we would spur one another on towards love and good deeds in these things, Lord. That we will no longer, Lord God, entertain or drink at the pool of bitterness, Lord God, of life and people's conversations. But Lord, we would bring the blood of Christ and the cross of Christ into every Mara, into every bitter bitter heart, Lord, in Jesus' name. So come and heal my brothers and sisters. Touch their hearts and their minds. Demolish strongholds now by the power of the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. We're just going to wait another minute. Let the Spirit of God work in your mind and your heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God loves you. Amen. He's the lover of your soul. Can you say he's the lover of my soul? He's given me a great tree. Can you say that? And that tree is Christ Jesus himself. Amen.